uh, anybody here in Northern wants to uh, run in the Progressive Party, uh, is there a deadline to run after the primary? That's the first question. And the other question is, how would you most uh, make people aware of what's happening in Arizona with uh, immigration uh, law? And how can we uh, keep it? Actually, what's it? What, if we let it continue, I think it's becoming into the second Palestinian environment here in the Western state. Well, I think uh, there are lots of good leaders. There are public. <laughs> Arizona's got more covers than it <laughs> expected to get. The Washington Post is full of it, New York Times, uh, TV. Hispanics know how to march. They turn out. They turn out far more than any other group. And, uh, Arizona's really in a plight. I mean, they're selling off their government buildings and leasing them back. Even their legislatures for sale, literally, to build it. I guess that's, that's one of the true things they've ever done. Dan People Dan. inside. Dan. As the first question, uh, only Dan Meek can answer, I can't answer that. August 24th. August 24th is the deadline for people who want to run uh, uh, okay. in November on the Progressive Party ballot. So talk to Dan. Coverage, and I can't afford the, in Oregon, there's a high risk pool for insurance. I'm wondering, are there ways before a national movement that we could do something citywide, like, I don't know, cooperative pools or something, um, to really have uh, kind of a safety net in the meantime? Well, you've got to see if you qualify for Medicaid. Do you qualify for Medicaid? Oh, yeah, maybe I do. Basically. I mean, it's not easy. I mean, you, a lot of people fall in the cracks, so they make, they don't make much money, but they make too much money for Medicaid, but check and see if you qualify for Medicaid. Okay, I, I make a little bit more than minimum wage. Yeah, there, well, you may not qualify. Yeah. But I don't know, every state has different rules. But you're not, you're not alone. The California Nurse Association just put out a report. The four major health insurance companies in 2009, in California, denied about 30 to 35 percent of the claims for procedures produced by doctors. And so doctors, in other words, said, you need this treatment, they denied over 30 percent of it. Well, it's just 5 percent, 6 percent. And then the Anthem, the big insurance company in California, had the nerve before the bill was passed in March, they announced a 39 percent hike. But then there was such an uproar that they rescinded. See what, you got a rumble. I mean, if, that's the first step. You know, they fear the rumble of the people. Nixon feared the rumble of the people, the science, EPA, OSHA. We could, anything we got through Congress, the guy was signing. He's the last Republican to fear liberals. The earmarks and on and perpetual uh, uh, You mean like a contemplation time for the public to read it? 60, 90 uh, days of the that would have to be legislated by the very Congress. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's not against the rules. There's, there's no binding referendum at the federal level. Uh, Mr. Peter, I'm curious uh, as to whether or not like, the right to vote or any of the uh, other rights that are given. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. <laughs> I had breakfast with Warren Buffett in late September. He had just gotten the book. Hadn't read it yet. Then I heard he picked it as one of the 30 books to be inside the arena for shareholders' meeting last week, which I attended. Uh, and, uh, he told me something very interesting. He said he, he and Bill Gates Jr. are meeting with mega billionaires all over the world to get them to commit 50% of their estate to good works. And then he sort of chuckled and said, we have to figure out what the good works are. And this is where the shift from charity to justice it's so important. Yeah. I'm going to try to do it, everything. I'm going to send it to 100 of the Forbes 400 that I selected to show some glimmer uh, by the description. And I sent it to some, some very rich people who were mentioned in the book who were allies. Uh, Ted Turner said he's read it, he liked it, he'll go to any meeting of billionaires. I have in a book organizing a group called Billionaires Against 
bullshit. <laughs> and uh, Bill Gohan uh, has, has sent me a sweet note, but she, she plays a really important role in the aesthetic dimension of social justice movement. And she held her own, she held her own very well among these men. And they met every month in Maui on the mountaintop hotel. Uh, Warren Beatty thinks he'll make a good movie. Although he stripped down, he said he wouldn't recognize it. Uh, William Gates Sr. is supposed to be reading it. Three of them have passed away. Uh, so, you know, they're older people. It's not necessarily them. There could be just many of them, a huge number of super rich people. Just a tiny fraction we're looking for. Whether it's prison reform, tax reform, they just, they need to learn along with everyone else. My question is real short. Uh, Mr. Nader, I would love to see you elected to federal office, and I believe that if you had run for uh, the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House of Representatives, that you would have a very high chance of getting elected. So my question is, why did you never run for those positions? I'm not interested in elective office, because I was a full-time citizen advocate, mobilizing, starting new groups. The door shut on all of us in Washington when the Democrats started bounding for the same commercial money as Republicans. Couldn't get anything done, so I wanted to try to encourage people all over the country to get into progressive politics, support Green Party, support other third parties, break up the obstacles to ballot access. You can't do that running for local or a Senate office. I would never have gotten on beat the press. You have to do it to presidential level. So I want to try to do it that way. I just began uh, waking up politically during the Bush years, so uh, this question comes from you know someone who's relatively in here. Um, it seems that once the people in power get the people's money, the, the public's money, mm. they pretty much do whatever they want, despite however many marches or however angry people yeah. get. It just once they have it, they do whatever they want with it. So, is could there be any benefit to a movement that is based on or centered around? Uh, denying that money to them, uh, you know, whether it's like, not paying taxes or you know, other things that they collect. Yeah. Well, there's a long tradition of uh, civil disobedience and not paying taxes by peace advocates, for example. And they get in trouble with the IRS, obviously. Uh, but sometimes they make an important point. Um, sort of like a conscientious objector in terms of uh, not being drafted. Uh, the second interesting thing is, from what you say, uh, is we've got to shift our tax burden away from labor and move it into areas where society likes the least or dislikes the most. And you start with the carbon tax on pollution, you tax corporate crime, you tax gambling, you tax speculation on Wall Street, which is a huge revenue getter, before you tax labor. I mean, it doesn't make sense. You should tax all the things you want to reduce and diminish before you tax something that you like and support. Yeah, but you're not going to get many people to do that. That takes a huge amount of courage and risk. The other thing you, you could do is we need to get a standing to sue law so taxpayers can sue when there's corruption or waste in government. And they, they're thrown out of that. Except at some state levels. But at federal level, it's the worst. They throw you out again and again. They don't even let you to make, make your case. It's an ancient doctrine that's been severely abused today. Uh, we've litigated and litigated. It's going to take legislation to do it. You want a taxpayer strike. I know you're talking about taxpayer struck. There are other ways to come up the works. There are people who have manuals for people like you. 